Llegamos ya al final, a la última ponencia de esta mañana, y lo hacemos con Stephen Downs, investigador de, en el Consejo Nacional de Investigación de Canadá y con una, pues, un auténtico experto en el campo de la educación online y los recursos libres. Stephen es autor del ya clásico El futuro del aprendizaje online, pasa por ser el pionero del concepto de e-learning 2.0 y también es un escritor prolífico con 135 artículos publicados en libros, revistas y publicaciones académicas y ha presentado su perspectiva única y personal sobre aprendizaje y tecnología en más de 250 ocasiones en 17 países de los cinco continentes. Estamos muy contentos de que haya aceptado nuestra invitación para visitar Girona y compartir con todos nosotros su visión personal sobre la educación y los recursos libres con la ponencia Supporting an Open Learning Network. And, okay, Stephen, the floor is yours. Do you need... that for a start. Thank you everyone. Hola. It's a pleasure to be here uh, in Girona. My first time in Girona. I very much appreciate the invitation of the conference organizers to come and speak to you today. My area of expertise is not open geographical systems. I love geography. I love maps and exploring, so I'm very much sympathetic with the work that you're doing. But my, my expertise is in online learning and learning technologies. And so the topic of my talk today is going to be on supporting an open learning network, free and open source software, open knowledge, and open content in learning. There's not supposed to be any sound. Those are just moving slides, they're not videos that I'm playing. Wait, I have to click twice. Uh, and that slide doesn't move at all. I tried. It's all, a, it's all a great experiment for me. Here's the thesis in one slide. And, and the thesis is this, and, and just to, to set the thesis up into context. When you're coming at a discipline like open technology, open source, free software, etc., from the perspective of education, from the perspective of providing learning to people, your context shifts. And the way you look at some of these subjects changes because your objective and your enterprise has changed. To follow that context then, we look at what providing an education is. And traditionally, an education has been thought of as something you give to people. You have some information, you give it to them, and then maybe you stuff it into their head. But Modern education is not like that. In modern education, we know that education does not happen without the willing participation of the learner, and that the process of acquiring an education is a process of engagement and interaction. You do not receive content and memorize it, you learn 
by working with content, by working with ideas, by working with machinery or systems or with other people, and you grow and you develop. And when you view learning in this way, what that means is, to make a long story short, learning and cognition happen in a network. And what that means is twofold. On the one hand, you're going to have to chill that microphone, because otherwise we're going to have feedback for the whole talk. And it's very distracting. Sorry. Uh, twofold. On the one hand, learning takes place in the human brain. We all know this. And the human brain is composed of neurons, as you can see, nice little neuron pictures. Actually, that was a video. I've spent a long time analyzing that video because it was privately produced and I couldn't get the rights to just play it. And so I thought, well, maybe I can duplicate it. And I thought about it. And it's like 49 euros to get a copy of this video. You know what it is? I spent a long time thinking about this. The lines are string. So they've set up some string, probably in a, a wooden frame that we can't see. And then they've taken gum and gummed the string together. It might be a little putty or something. So, so the strings are joined with putty. And then they created the animation by darkening the room and shining a flashlight on it. String, gum, and a flashlight, 49 euros. I'm going to make one of these myself, and I'll make it available for free. So, learning happens in a network in the human brain. Learning also happens in a network in society. When you analyze the structure of learning in society, it is of a social network of humans, human interaction, and the artifacts that humans produce in the process of this interaction Again, the same sort of thing. Signals being sent from one person to another person to another person. So the logic of education is the logic of networks. And the logic of networks is what necessitates open learning because in a single sentence slogan, networks need to be open to function. A closed network cannot function. A network must be open. Well, what does that mean? We have the traditional definition, the definition that is in use in this conference. Saw some appeal to it in the previous talk. The definition of openness, freedom to run software, to, to read the source code, to share the software, and to modify the software. And that's a fairly common definition, and there are certain implications of that definition. For example, as we just heard in the previous talk, the prohibition on small print limitations against certain uses of the software, for example. But now, we want to take a look at the perspective from which that definition of open software is framed. It's framed from the perspective of someone who holds the software, someone who has the software. It's framed from the perspective of the sorts of things that you can do with that software. Arguably, and I would argue, it actually places the freedom in the software. It is our software that is free, not ourselves. From the perspective of education, there is a concern about the materials being more free than the learner. So I'm going to step back from this definition. I wanna, by the end of the talk, I'm going to revisit the definition of free in the light of work that takes place in free and open education. This is David Wiley. This is the person respectable conferences invite instead of me. I'm just kidding. 
Uh, David uh, and I are, are longtime friends and opponents. And he has had a major influence in discussions of free and open education. He's one of the authors of the, one of the first free content licenses. And he talks about openness in education, educational content, educational systems. And he is largely, along with a small group of other people, responsible for framing the different aspects of the debate of open education. And I'll represent that frame as follows. In education, openness is defined in three major areas. Open standards, open software, and open systems. And then within that openness, there are three areas of focus. Open educational resources, open courses, and then what is currently the frontier in open education, open assessment. This mess, and it is a bit of a mess, is the roadmap for open education standards. I thought about putting a video behind that, but I thought that would be a very bad idea. This is the, the current state of play. Basically what these specifications and standards are for is to define the different aspects of learning technology, learning resources, and the learning experience. The grandfather of all the open education standards is the Aviation Industry Computer-Based Training Community, or Committee, or AICC, and it is worth reflecting that the core standard in open learning came from training manuals for pilots. And it represents a perspective that has shaped the history of open learning. Following AICC, a consortium of commercial organizations and universities came together to form an, an organization called Instructional Management Systems, IMS, now known as IMS Global. And they came out with a series of standards. Learning object metadata is the primary, the core standard. And learning object metadata is designed in order to describe learning resources, in order to facilitate their discovery and their reuse. As well as learning object metadata, IMS came up with a standard called content packaging and this reflects the training manual school of learning whereby you would take some learning content, some multimedia such as videos or photos or, or simulations, package it together, put it on a CD-ROM and mail it to you. And so learning or content packaging was intended to create a manifest of all the learning materials that were shipped to you in a package. The modern version of it would be you zip it up and send it as a zip file to people, all one big package. That was learning. Over time, as, I, as I've said, we have modern learning and the idea of interaction and activity, and so we have a standard called learning design. Learning design is originally based on something called the educational modeling language by Rob Koper at the Open University of the Netherlands. IMS formalized it and standardized it and called it learning design. And it's kind of neat because the model that it uses in order to describe learning is the model of a play where each of the students and the instructor takes the place, takes the role of an actor. And so learning design choreographs the activities of the different actors through a learning activity. But it's still all very, well, choreographed. And it doesn't support the other kind of theater, improvisational theater, which is something that we're finding works better in a learning environment. Common cartridge is, as the name implies, a way of packaging a learning resource as though it were a cartridge that you could plug into a learning management system. And then learning tools interoperability is a specification describing how learning resources 
can access system tools or system resources, such as a discussion area or a chat area. There are other IMS standards, quite a number of them, but these are the most important of them. These have been formalized. They've been first formalized by IEEE, Learning Technology Subcommittee, and they passed something called 1484.12 Learning Object Metadata, which is really just a stylized version of the IMS Learning Object Metadata. A very important and influential application profile of this is called SCORM. That stands for Shareable Course Object Reference Model. Um, and it was created by uh, an organization called Advanced Distributed Learning, ADL. And ADL was created by the United States military in order to provide military training. You can get this sense of where all the standards are coming from in learning, right? From commercial companies, from military, to some degree from government. Finally, all of these have been very formally specified in ISO um, Joint or JTC 1 Subcommittee 36 Metadata for Learning Resources. What's interesting, I find, about all of these specifications is, and, and I had to word the title of this slide carefully, it was originally titled Open Standards Roadmap. But for the most part, not completely, but for the most part, these standards are not, in fact, open. You have to pay IEEE for them. You have to become a member of IMS. So in the field of education, although there are standards, the openness of these standards is the subject to some question. In education, there is a solid tradition, however, of open source software. The dominant software used in education is called the learning management system. And the purpose of the learning management system, those of you who've used them are familiar with them, is to organize learning content and facilitate interactions among the participants in a class. Probably the most well-known of these is a software package called Moodle. And Moodle was specifically designed as a construction, a constructivist, object-oriented learning environment. But Moodle isn't the only open source software available for education. There's the Open Knowledge Initiative, which was founded by MIT, which has an LMS called Sakai. <clears throat> and the difference between Sakai and Moodle is, Moodle is lightweight, PHP, anybody can run it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sakai is heavyweight, enterprise, Java, almost nobody can run it. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm stealing Malcolm's water because, well, <laughs> sorry Malcolm. Another piece of very interesting open source software in education is an application called ELG. Doesn't stand for anything. That's all they say. And what ELG is, is social networking application applied to learning. Hasn't been as widely adopted, but Athabasca University in Canada probably has the largest educational ELG installation. ATutor is another open source learning management system. <coughs> LAMS, or Learning Activity Management System, is a plugin that you can use in Sakai or use in Moodle, and what it does is it allows course authors or course instructors to create learning designs using the uh, IMS learning design specification and create learning designs to be implemented in the learning management system. For all of you, I would recommend even more having a look at something called the Public Knowledge Pro uh, Project. This is uh, based in Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, Canada. What the Public Knowledge Project has produced is something called Open Journal Systems, which is a mechanism 
that allows people to publish their own open journal online and it supports reviewing and editing and all of the functions you would normally associate with a journal. Public Knowledge Project also produces something called the Open Conference Systems. And what this does is it handles all the logistics of running a conference, your online conference presence, your website, again, the reviews and all the rest of it. Uh, and again, it's open software, free and open source software. This is the messiest slide in the whole deck. I tried to make it neat, but there was no way. The most activity right now taking place in education is in the area of open education resources, or OERs. And this is a concept that has caught the imagination of major international bodies such as OECD and UNICEF and major uh, charitable funds like the uh, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation or the Wellcome Trust and others. And the idea of open educational resources is the provision of learning resources that are free and open. There's a wide variety of projects huge number of projects, many different models. Probably the most well-known is something called OCW, or MIT's Open Courseware Project. And what they did, they started about 10 years ago, and they took the handouts and other materials that MIT professors used in class, they digitized them, they went through a long and expensive rights clearing effort, and then they mounted all of these materials online. They were very clear to say when they launched this that they are not providing an MIT education for free. You have to come to MIT and pay 10, 20, whatever thousands of dollars of tuition to get that. Just the materials are free. So I think of it as the, the world's largest educational advertising project. Another one, you can see it running in the background, is Khan Academy. That one has caught the interest of TED recently, but, but again, it's been around a lot for a while. And what Khan Academy is, is some guy just started recording a whole bunch of YouTube videos and posting them online. Another initiative is called Merlot. I forget what it stands for. It's an American group. The idea of Merlot is you send them your open educational resource, then they will have university professors review it and rank it. That unfortunately created a bit of a bottleneck and while several thousand resources were submitted to Merlot, only a few hundred were ever reviewed. <coughs> Connections is a project out of Rice University and what Connections provides is an environment that you go visit, <coughs> you can't get the software yet, so you go visit their environment because marketing is very important use their server and create your open learning resource on the connection site and then publish it and make it available for free. Spark BOAI, which is Budapest Open Access Initiative, and the Open Archives Initiative, and the uh, Confederation of Open Access Repositories, these are all representative of a subsidiary well, maybe I shouldn't say subsidiary, a separate movement toward open access journals. And while I'm talking about open education, there's a whole separate world focused on open access for academic journals. Then finally, Open University has launched its own Open Learn project. And these are complete course packages you go to the Open University, you sign up for one of the course packages, you study for these online. Now, with respect to licensing, and, and here now we're, we're getting into the different kind of definitions of open, because a lot of what I've described, MIT stuff, YouTube videos, uh, open journals, connection course packages on a website, a lot of these in no way fit any sort of definition of software. They don't even really fit any sort of definition of content. A lot of them are best represented perhaps as services. And a lot of what we talk about 
in, in respect to free software, free content and that almost doesn't even make sense when applied to them. What is it to say that a YouTube video is open? Does that mean that you can examine the source? That, well, maybe. Uh, does it mean that you can take it and sell it? Maybe. In the field of open educational resources, the predominant licensing originally started off to be the GNU free document license, but has since then evolved into one of the Creative Commons licenses. And so when you look at open educational resources, you will find almost all of them, almost all of them, licensed under some version of Creative Commons. I assume that you're all familiar with Creative Commons, or mostly familiar, and we all know that there are different flavors or different varieties of Creative Commons. The buy or attribution requirement, the share alike requirement, the non-commercial requirement, and of course the no derivatives requirement. And a person applying a Creative Commons is able to make a selection out of these different conditions. My own material, for example, I license under Creative Commons by share alike non-commercial. There is a very large debate in the field of education right now about whether free and open learning resources ought to be licensable as commercial resources, ought to be allowed to be used by commercial agencies in order to make money. We'll come back to that. The model that has been used to create open educational resources has been very much the model that has been used to create educational resources in general. And this model is a publishing model. This model is a model where you get a bunch of experts together, you pay them a lot of money, or if it's publishing, you pay them nothing. <laughs> Uh, you get them to spend a lot of time and money producing educational resources. You package them. That's why we have content packaging, right? And then you distribute them. And even the, the open educational resources models have been in those, this mold. OECD, for example, came out with a report three or four years ago on open educational resources called Giving Knowledge for Free. And it's this model of learning where learning is a thing that you give to people. Learning is software that you give to people. Learning is a book that you give to people. This right away raises the question, the problem of sustainability of open educational resources. And it is the question of sustainability that has been the major debate in educational circles. There are different models, and I run, once wrote a paper for OECD on those different models. Among them, the endowment model, and that's where you get a large amount of money, you put it to the side, and then you use the interest from that money in order to run your open knowledge project. Uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy used that model, for example. That model worked really well until there was a stock market crash. Then it stopped working. <laughs> Another model, and IMS uses this model, is the membership model. And basically the membership model is as the name implies. You create a consortium and then you have memberships to that consortium and you sell memberships. And the sale of memberships is what sustains the organization. The problem is when you sell memberships to a consortium, the members expect a little extra for what they've bought. And so IMS, for example, the members get access to forthcoming IMS standards well before any of the competitors, which means commercial software vendors view IMS standards long before open source software vendors. Another mechanism is through donations. Uh, National Public Radio in the U.S. does that. Uh, Wikipedia does that. There's a whole bunch of organizations that live on donations. The problem is 
donations come in a flood during the good times, but when you have a recession, it gets harder and harder to get donations. As well, donations are easy to get at the beginning of a project, but then you get what is called donor fatigue, and people get tired of donating to the same project year after year after year. Why don't they become sustainable, people begin to say, with some reason. Because of these difficulties, and because of the commercial imperative in educational content production, and, and believe me, there is a commercial imperative there. Education, educational content, educational publishing, these are multi-billion dollar industries. And they have learned through decades, centuries, of dealing with people who want to make knowledge available for free. They've, they've, they've learned all the tricks. Another paper I presented at one of David Wiley's conferences, actually, talked about the mechanisms that commercial content providers use in order to marginalize free educational content. Lock-in is a classic example. You have to use one of their software systems. The software system will only run commercial content iTunes is a classic example of that. The Kindle is a classic example of that. But not just that. High bar. It's a term I made up. You don't have to use it. If you look at the IMS metadata standards, there are something like 67 separate fields that you have to fill out for each resource. SCORM makes these fields mandatory. In order to produce content that is SCORM compliant, you must fill out all the fields. Well, what free and open source content movement can afford to fill out 67 fields for every single resource that it produces? The overhead is extreme. Or another example, there, there's a whole other field of digital rights management standards, the open digital rights language initiative uh, as compared to the MPEG rights expression language, which is the commercial alternative, both of those create significant overhead on the producers of free material to ensure and be able to prove that their content is appropriately licensed. We just had a lawyer up here. You want to talk about the most nervous organizations in the world. They are educational organizations. They do not want to even think of risking being sued. So all you have to do to get an educational institution to use commercial content is threaten them with a lawsuit. And the way you threaten them with a lawsuit is you say that the open content has not sufficiently established that it is risk free. That sound familiar? Flooding, or the Starbucks approach. We had a discussion about Starbucks yesterday. Here's what Starbucks does in North America. Uh, you take a downtown area, the ordinary downtown area, it's got coffee shops and cafes and things like that. Starbucks moves in, drops 20 Starbucks within a five block area. You might think, it's ridiculous. And it is ridiculous. Nobody needs 20 Starbucks in a five block area. But what happens is they come into the area, they flood the area, they have cheap coffee, giveaways, lounges, free Wi-Fi, all of that. And within a year or two, everybody else has been put out of business. Now Starbucks is the only place in town to get a coffee. Wi-Fi now costs $5 an hour. You can only sit in the chair for half an hour. Uh, the coffee, four fifty a coffee. That's the, that's the principle of, of flooding. And then there's probably the most insidious of all, conversion, which is where the commercial entity will take open content that exists in the wild. I say in the wild, I don't mean in the wild, but you know what I mean. And convert it into proprietary content. And then using the other tactics make it so it's not possible to find the proprietary con or the open content. Google used to have a big problem with this. 
You're all familiar with Wikipedia. Wikipedia used the uh, license that allows commercial use. So commercial providers came, took all of Wikipedia's content, put it in a little narrow column, put 18 ads on each side, and then used search engine optimization to market it like crazy. For a while, you could not find the Wikipedia content. If you did a search, even if you used Wikipedia in your search, you'd get one of these commercial sites. Now, Google has changed their page rank mechanism. So Wikipedia shows up at the top, and that's nice. But that works only for Wikipedia. The search engine optimizers have done this with all of the rest of the free content that's out there. And so even now, we're in a situation where it's harder and harder and harder to find the free content, even if the free content exists, because the providers of commercial content are able to pay for and leverage the resources for search engine optimization, for legal and other options, for legislative lobbying and the rest of it to ensure that they have a primary position in the marketplace. Well, <clears throat> we think about education, we think about open education. The purpose of open education isn't to ensure that some student can be maximally free with a piece of content that they have in their hands. The purpose of open education is to make sure they can get the content into their hands in the first place. It's to make sure that they can use that content and participate in a network. And so the possibility of commercializing open educational resources strikes at the heart of the goal of open education. Some colleagues and I have developed an alternative, a network-based approach to online learning called the Massive Open Online Course. And what this is, is a focus not simply on educational content, but access to the educational network itself. And what we've done is we've set up a learning model whereby we host a course online, we make that course available to anybody who wishes to take part. And then the design of the course is not one based on a certain standard curriculum and certain standard curricular materials, but rather is based on a series of discussions that the course moderators have among themselves and with whomever wishes to follow along. And what's interesting about a MOOC, which is what we call it, is that the course itself is distributed. It does not happen in just one place. Oh, it starts in one place, because it has to start somewhere. But what we tell participants in the course is that we would like you to participate in whatever environment feels comfortable to you. If you're comfortable in Blogger, use Blogger. If you're comfortable in WordPress, use WordPress. Whatever works best for you. Because the fundamental principle of a MOOC is to enable access. If you're comfortable on a Mac, use a Mac. There are no prejudices in a MOOC. It's up to the people who are participating in the course to decide how they are going to participate. They choose their own resources. They are encouraged to bring resources in from other places. We don't create course packages. We don't create learning design or any of that sort of thing. We create a mosaic, a menu, a smorgasbord of educational resources related to the topic that we're talking about. People look at whatever resources they think are appropriate to them. There's always too many resources for anyone to look at. And then they engage in discussion. And they engage in activities. 
whatever is appropriate to the learning that is taking place. The MOOC is a new phenomenon. It's only begun in the last few years. But the tradition behind the MOOC has gone on for decades. You might have noticed the, the gray hair. I remember the early days of the internet. <laughs> I remember the early days of the internet when they would have email corsets and some guy at some university somewhere would send out an email every day and it would teach you IRC because we had IRC back then or it would teach you well the beginning days of HTML it would teach you HTML etc and so it's out of that tradition but of course that tradition goes back even further right to the means of common education through pamphlets and self-organizing communities and public activism. So we're not saying that we're inventing anything with a moot. We're just saying that it's the newest instantiation of a very old idea. Right now there are seven, yes, seven moots that I know of and there are more being created all the time. This one here, Digital Storytelling, DS106, was created by Jim Groom, uh, who's based in the United States. It combines uh, 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 an ice cast radio station, video production, uh, photo manipulation, animation, or animated GIFs, and all the rest of it uh, in this ridiculous create, creative frenzy. Critical literacies is a course that I did with uh, some colleagues focusing on the literacies needed in order to function in the new world. And as you can see, there are various other courses that have been taught over the last few years. I say taught very loosely. Maybe I should say facilitated, but even that is generous. The instructors in these courses go into these courses and act like students. And that has an interesting effect. It forces the students to act like instructors. Because someone has to be mature and responsible, and we're not going to be. So we come back to the definition of openness, the definition of freedom. And the model that Richard Stallman came up with works well, works incredibly well for software. And, and he'd be the first person to tell you that. But he would also be the first person to tell you it was designed for software. It wasn't designed to apply to everything. And that, that would be a misinterpretation of what Stallman was trying to say. And in open education, we are trying to do something very different from open source software, as different as the providers of open data are doing from open source software. And we saw the, 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 uh, the open definition and the different criteria that come into play there. In open education, access rather than control is the key thing. In open education, we're focused on community, not content, which means freedom in open education is something that belongs to people, not software. And so the definition is different. This is the definition that I use. It's a definition based on the principles of successful functioning in networks. How networks work well, how networks are effective, how to work well within a network. There are four conditions. It's not intended to be gospel. It's not intended to be the be-all and end-all. My computer's on reserve battery power. <laughs> there are four conditions. Autonomy. The purpose, the principle of open learning is that learners should be autonomous. Setting their own goals, following their own values, choosing their own curriculum, learning what they want to learn. First and most fundamental principle. Diversity. 
The intent of an education system is not to produce a whole bunch of people who are the same, but to produce a whole bunch of people who are different, who have learned different things, have different skills, exercise different capacities. Because when everybody's the same, nobody has anything to talk about. It's only through difference that we get interaction and communication that makes any sense whatsoever. Openness refers both to the property of communication in a network. Commercialization of educational resources counters openness because it creates barriers to education. It is a model of education that is based on denying access to education to poor people. We don't call that freedom. We call that denying access to education to poor people. And openness refers to the construction of the network itself. Education isn't something you're either in or you're out. It's not something that should be reserved for the privileged who can afford to pay tuition. It should be open to everybody. Courses are open, programs are open, learning is open. And the idea is an open network is able to bring information, people, resources in from outside of it. Again, commercialized education is based on putting a barrier at the edge of education and denying people access. Totally contrary to the purpose of open education. And then finally, interactivity. The traditional model is based on broadcasting where one person has all the knowledge and then they spread it or diffuse it through a community. The model of interactivity is one where the knowledge is emergent from the activities and the conversations of the community. Does not belong to any individual, cannot be contained within any individual, but is rather produced by the combined cooperative not collective, but cooperative activities of all of the people involved in the network. Mechanisms that we've used in the MOOC, fairly straightforward, simple mechanisms, aggregate using open content standards, learning object metadata, RSS, Dublin Core, friend of a friend, whatever else we can get our hands on. Remix put new resources beside each other, don't combine them, but just rearrange them, repurpose, create our own content, localize our own content, translate to our own language, put in our own words, create our own media, and then feed forward, transmit or send to the next person along in the network. It's a feed it forward or pay it forward model of education, a pay it forward model of open knowledge and open learning. So that's about where we are right now in open learning. We're facing the same challenges that you're facing. We're looking at the world of big data and the web of data, the semantic web, syndication formats, geographical formats, friend of a friend, looking at how do we bring these things together in such a way that they support rather than hinder learning. We're looking at the new world of mashups, Web 2.0, APIs, the cloud social networks, but we're looking at it from a perspective of not what freedoms they enable, but what access they enable, what rights they enable, how much they empower rather than impose controls on people who would like to learn in their own way, in their own time. And so, whoops, press twice. That's my presentation on free learning. And just, just as a final note, uh, free learning isn't just uh, a profession, it's an avocation, it's a lifestyle. It's based on openly sharing the work that you do because learning in a community is learning from members of that community. I, I've been asked what my pedagogy theory is, my theory of pedagogy. My theory of pedagogy is so simple 
It can hardly be called a theory. Uh, the instructor, the role of the instructor is to model and demonstrate. The role of the learner is to practice and reflect. And that's my theory of pedagogy. Very simple. But it puts a responsibility on all of us, especially those of us who have knowledge, those of us who have skills, because we are all teachers in a network. We are all educators. And so it's up to all of us to model and demonstrate our practices. That's why I've got the link to presentations. One of the things that I do is present. And so I make sure that when I do a presentation, Oh, I might use a Mac, but I make sure that I've provided open access to that presentation. I've got a little video recording there on the cheapest camera I can find. And I make sure I put the video online available for free. I've got an audio recording running just in case the video fails. And if all of that fails, I'll ask the conference for it. I'll put the slides on, on this site here for free as well. The idea here is to make my practice as open as possible. And that is the responsibility, I would say, of anyone who is in an educational capacity. And the message that I would bring to you is not the message about open licensing, because that's legalism. What the message I bring to you is, is to be open in your own practice, to see yourselves not simply as creators of software or users of geographical systems, but as educators with a responsibility and an incentive to model and share and demonstrate your practice so that people, wherever they may be, are able to learn from you. And that's my presentation, and I thank you very much for your time.